Susie Lyle disappeared on Monday, March 2nd, 1998. When a person disappears without a trace, often the most critical information is hidden in their actions and words from the days before they vanished. Susie Lyle's last known whereabouts may hold the clues to what happened to her. Susie Lyle is a straight A student who keeps to herself, only putting her inner thoughts on paper. I think it really was a therapeutic way of dealing with some of the problems that she was facing in her day-to-day -day, uh, social relationships. One night, the straight-laced college sophomore doesn't return numerous phone calls. I knew right away there was something wrong. Investigators begin to follow a winding trail. On the night in question, he says that he remembers her getting on the bus. Police scour the community. The Nike man did kind of increase our hopes. And a grieving family makes it their singular mission to find their missing daughter. It's something that you never think is going to happen to you as a family. September 1998. 19-year-old Susie Lyle is taking stock of her new dorm room. The wall is decorated with her favorite tie-dye sheet, and her school books are strewn across the floor. For the first time in ages, she thinks she's found an exciting place where she can settle in. It's Susie's sophomore year, and she's transferred here to the State University at Albany after having spent two semesters at another college that didn't challenge her academically. Susie actually said, I could teach the class. And she said, I want to learn the science of computers. And she felt that SUNY Albany would have a better computer science course. Susie has also taken on a part-time job at a computer software store in a nearby mall. She's living and breathing computers, which is exactly how she likes it. Between classes and work, she spends most of her free time with her boyfriend, Richard, who shares Susie's love for all things high-tech. He was a little bit more intelligent than some of the other people, and he was also in the same line where, you know, yeah, I build a computer. You mean you're building computers too? And that's how they kind of really got going with each other. Susie was smart as a whip, even as a young child. She grew up in a loving family in the small town of Boston Spa, New York, and wowed everyone with her sharp mind and quick wit. Susie was somebody who was very intelligent right from day one. I know mothers always say that about their children, and I never thought about it, but my husband said there's something about her that is so different than the other kids. Doug and Mary Lyle had always planned on having just two children, but Susie was a very welcome surprise. I think she was a special gift to us, and because she was so much uh, younger than her brother and sister, they became like a second set of parents, and uh, we all kind of doted over her. Susie and her older brother Stephen were especially close. When she got to be about one or two, he delivered newspapers, and he used to ride his bike around, and he wanted a baby seat on the back of his bike. So why do you want that? You know, it's got to be, it's hard enough to deliver papers. He'd dress her up in the morning, get her all dressed in a fancy little outfit, and they'd go out, and he'd drive her all over the neighborhood. I said, why are you doing that? And he said, because I get bigger tips when, <laughs> when I have her. <laughs> She and Steve used to spend quite a bit of time together, and, uh, and you know, Steve was kind of uh, on the shy side and, and was kind of private and uh, had kind of a small group of friends, but I, I think really uh, he and uh, Susie became kind of best friends in a way. When Susie became a teenager, Stephen made a point of looking out for her. He would take her to the concerts and he never let her go by herself. He always took her. Or he would pick her up after school when he was home 
from college, and he'd pick her up and he would um, take her out to eat. Susie was a keen observer of human nature, but she also liked to keep to herself. Over time, she became most at ease in the world of computers. The librarian who was having trouble with a computer, they called on Susie. She was rebuilding computers and building bigger and better computers than most people had by putting in, you know, extra parts. Uh, I guess she would have considered her a geek. In high school, Susie had a hard time fitting in with her classmates and seldom socialized outside of school. In classes, we sat together frequently. We would sit together in study halls. We'd sit together at lunch, things like that. But outside of school, we didn't. I don't really feel that she had any deep, close, best friend, girlfriend type relationships in school. With few friends to confide in, Susie expressed herself through poetry. I think it, it really was a therapeutic way of dealing with some of the problems that she was facing in her day-to-day -day, uh, you know, social relationships. One time she was in the shower, taking a shower, and I heard the door open. The shower was still running, and look, there she is wrapped in a towel, running down the hall, soap still in her hair. And I said, Susie, where are you going? And she said, I just got a poem in my head, and I have to write it down before I lose it. And she would write the poem down. Some of them are pretty profound, I think, but... It is kind of sad that she didn't seem to have anybody that she talked to about anything vocally. It was all pen to paper where her emotions went. Susie decided to turn to the internet for friends. This was before chat rooms, they had bulletin boards. This was her way of, of really connecting with people and, and it probably made it easier because she didn't have to, to necessarily meet with them face to face. She could do it over the computer and type back and forth. After months of communicating online with other teenagers in the Boston Spa area, Susie was asked to join a computer club that would meet monthly at a local coffee shop. I just didn't feel comfortable with her meeting people that, you know, were virtually strangers. To ease Mary's mind, Susie's father, Doug, accompanied Susie to her first meeting. They met the club's president, Richard Condon, a tall computer whiz. Richard was instantly attracted to Susie, but it took several months of him pursuing her before she reciprocated his feelings. My first impression of uh, Richard was that uh, he appeared to be uh, very well-spoken, very intelligent, uh, but uh, probably in a sense, maybe, you know, kind of mature beyond his years. Susie and Richard started dating when Susie was 16. Richard was a year older. Although tension between them cropped up periodically, they continued their romance for three years. I think she tried to break up with Rich a few times, and every time she tried to break up with him, he would call her up and beg her not to do it. Although they attend different colleges, Susie and Richard kept the relationship going. Her parents believed that in addition to wanting more rigorous classes, Susie's decision to transfer colleges is connected to Richard. They would now be only 10 minutes apart, instead of two hours. She told us that she wanted to transfer to, uh, to SUNY Albany because they had a better computer science program, which they did, they had a much stronger program. But I, I think the, the bottom line was that she either was feeling pressured to move back closer to Albany or wanted to, on her own volition, move back closer to her boyfriend. I think that was the bottom line. On March 3rd, 1998, six months after Susie moves into her new dorm room, Doug and Mary Lyle are getting dressed to go visit their son Stephen in Lake George when their phone rings. It's Susie's boyfriend, Richard. I was getting myself ready and I got the phone call and it was Rich and he said, did you know Susie didn't come back to campus last night? I couldn't believe what he said, and I came, I knew right away there was something wrong. Doug and Mary Lyle can't fathom where Susie could be. She's always been a creature of habit, 
and smart about letting people know her whereabouts. They feel overwhelmed and strangely paralyzed. We don't know what to do. We're in a state of shock. Coming up, Susie's mother receives a haunting message from her daughter after her disappearance. It said the usual, and I love you, and, you know, see you soon. It's the morning of Tuesday, March 3rd, 1998, and Doug and Mary Lyle have just received an alarming phone call about their daughter, Susie. The usually conscientious sophomore at the University at Albany is not answering emails or her dorm room phone. Her boyfriend, Richard, grew increasingly concerned and reached out to Susie's parents. Their usual routine was Susie would call them as soon as she would get back to the dorm or she would email him and they would chat on the computer. She was as right as rain. I mean, she was a person of, she did things on schedule. But Richard tells the Lyles he has been trying to contact Susie since the night before and he hasn't heard from her. Knowing this is uncharacteristic of Susie, Doug decides to alert the University at Albany campus police. He gave us a call and we started to look for her right away. We called the uh, Residence Life and spoke with the RA and he went to a room and couldn't locate her. Nothing in Susie's room appears to be out of place or missing. On the off chance that Susie might be on campus but intentionally keeping a low profile, an officer goes to her next class to see if she shows up, but she never appears. At that point, I decided to go down to the campus and to go into the campus safety office. Doug leaves Mary waiting by the phone at home and makes the unsettling 30-minute drive to Albany. When he arrives, he's greeted by police and an officer reassures him that their department is scouring the campus looking for Susie. I, I spent a good part of that day kind of, uh, you know, sitting in the, in the campus safety office and kind of waiting for, for information. As the campus police talk to Susie's sweet mates, co-workers and other students, they're able to piece together a timeline of her last known whereabouts. They find out Susie took a midterm Monday morning and then boarded a city bus on campus to go to work at four that afternoon. Garland Nelson, Susie's boss at the computer software store in the mall, remembers Susie being stressed out in the days leading up to Monday. She had some concerns about working because she was this exam that was a hardcore exam that she had to really kind of ace. And I'm like, oh, you okay? No, yeah, I was just really worried about it. All right, well, this, like I always tell them, yo, go blow it up. <laughs> like, you know, say this, go handle it. Garland recalls Susie coming into work Monday after taking her midterm. She seemed to be back to her normal self. She came in the back, yo, what's up, girl? Yo, did you blow it up? She said, ah. You know, she was kind of like iffy about it, like most of us would be. You wouldn't think any, I think I did okay, you know. I was like, all right, well, these are my tasks. This is what I need you to do. She was doing a thing, quiet, labeling, you know, putting skews on game boxes, and I mean, nothing out of the ordinary. Monday night, Garland's shift ends before Susie's. So he's surprised when he shows up for work Tuesday and learns Susie is missing. But at first, he's not alarmed because she's been unaccounted for for less than 24 hours. I'm still thinking, yo, she's a college student, you know? She was usually on tap. Everyone always had access to her. Maybe she had a moment, you know? She's entitled to do whatever she wants. But when Susie's boyfriend, Richard, comes by the store and her mother calls looking for Susie, Garland starts to believe something more serious is going on. He asks the night supervisor if he remembers seeing Susie leave the night before. He was like, he left out the back way to get out of Crossgates Mall. It's not exactly the super duper well lit spot, but the only people back there are people who usually work in the mall. And according to him, there was nothing out of the ordinary. Back at home, 
Mary Lyle is beside herself. She tries to stay calm by doing routine tasks. While sorting through the day's mail, something catches her attention. A birthday card from Susie. She must have put it in the mail on Monday during the day, you know, wasn't able to do it on Sunday, or she put it in the mail at the mall, and I got it the next day, and that was really hard. Overwhelmed with emotion, Mary opens the card addressed to her and finds a message from Susie. You know, it said the usual, and I love you, and, you know, see you soon. For Mary... These are painful words to read, with her daughter still missing. But police are still actively searching. They talk to the city bus drivers whose routes stop at Crossgate Mall. The bus driver recognized Suzanne Lyle's photograph. On the night in question, he says that he remembers her getting on the bus at the bus stop where she usually takes that bus. He couldn't say for certain whether she got off the bus at the bus stop to the campus. He was able to say that she was not downtown at the final stop. While police continue their investigation, Susie's mother waits by the phone at home, feeling helpless and panicked. Stephen, her oldest son, has arrived to help her call friends and family, asking if anyone has seen or heard from Susie but no one has heard from her. Then, Mary has an inspiration. She decides to call the bank to see if Susie's ATM card has been used. I knew she had about $120 in her ATM at that time. And the operator said, no, the card hasn't been used. I was sitting looking at the clock on the microwave oven, and it was about 10 minutes to four, and the operator said, just a minute, let me check something. And she comes back and she said, that card was just used uh, around 10 minutes to four. Mary is taken aback by the report. Could everyone be overreacting? Maybe Susie did just need some time to herself. And I said, you're kidding. I said, where was it used? Uh, was the PIN number correct? Um, you know, I was asking her a lot of questions, and she said the PIN number was a direct hit. The card was used. She couldn't tell me because it was a Cirrus account, and she had to wait till the vendor turned in his receipts, which wouldn't be until evening or early the next morning. The woman promises Mary that she'll call her the next morning when she has the ATM machine's location. Meanwhile, the sun is beginning to set, and Doug Lyle knows he needs to return home to comfort his wife. He can't believe he doesn't have any answers for her. I kind of came home with my tail between my legs and uh, knowing that uh, I was you know, feeling helpless but there, I didn't feel like there was a whole bunch that I could do. The Lyle family tries to stay positive. They know Susie has another midterm the next morning. Although it seems like a stretch, they cling to the notion that perhaps she just needed some alone time and will still show up to take her exam. For the Lyles, the night passes slowly as they continue to run scenarios through their heads. Sleep is impossible. When dawn finally breaks, Mary gets the phone call she has been waiting for. The woman from the bank is on the line, and she knows where Susie's ATM card was used late Tuesday afternoon. Coming up, police finally receive their first possible break in an otherwise confounding case. We did not know if he was possibly involved with her abduction or maybe had used the ATM card or maybe was just possibly a witness of something. 19-year-old Susie Lyle's disappearance is mystifying to her parents. They know it's common for most college students to be out of contact for 24 hours, but not Susie. She's known for staying in touch with her family and boyfriend. On Tuesday, March 3rd, Susie had been missing for a little less than 24 hours when her mother did some digging and learned that her daughter's ATM card had just been used. After a long night of waiting, 
Susie's parents finally get a call from the bank with more information about the transaction. She said the card was used at an ATM machine about two and a half, three miles from campus. Mary doesn't know what to make of the news. Is Susie using her ATM card? Or does someone else have it? Susie always withdraws precisely $20. So when the bank tells Mary that the transaction was for that amount and that the PIN number was a direct hit, her first reaction is, that sounds like Susie. But if it was her daughter, where is she now? I was just concerned about where she was and if she was hurt, if she was, you know, what, what was the problem, what was going on. The security department at the bank also gives Mary more insight into Susie's last known activities on Monday, the day she disappeared. That day that she left to go to work, she took $20 out of the ATM machine across the street where she caught the bus from campus. And she also took another 20 out at the mall where she worked. Mary is puzzled about why her daughter would make two stops at the ATM, one right after the other on Monday. And also why Susie's card was used Tuesday the day after she was last seen. When Mary calls the campus police to give them the information, they update her on their progress. The night before, they were able to track down a student who saw Susie getting off the bus on campus Monday night. One student said that she noticed Suzanne on the number 12 bus at Collin Circle around 9.45 p.m. She believes that Suzanne was alone she simply said that she didn't speak with Suzanne, but she thought she saw Suzanne getting off the bus. The new information offers little to go on. But Susie's family and police still hope that Susie's ATM card will trigger other leads. Investigators check with the clerk at the convenience store, where the Tuesday transaction took place. But the clerk doesn't recognize Susie's picture. Just a few miles up the road, back at campus, Another officer tracks down a couple of Susie's sweetmates to see if they saw or heard Susie Monday night. They knew Susie didn't come back that night because Susie had a lot of keys and key fobs all kind of strung together. And when she would come in and open up her door, the keys would jingle against the door. And they didn't hear that, that noise that they always kind of listened for for her coming in. So, so they were positive that they did, did, did not hear her come in that night, that she did not get back to her room. The officer also checks to see if Susie turns up for her classes that afternoon. But for the second day in a row, she is a no-show. As more tips come in, the campus police recognize that they need additional resources. They call the New York State Police for assistance. We established a command post and talk to the people from the SUNY Police Department to try to determine what facts they had and, and what leads we needed to run to try to find out what happened to Suzanne. Susie's father, Doug, and her brother, Stephen, do an exhaustive search of campus and areas surrounding the mall. I know Doug went down there several times. I never went down because I just, I was a basket case. I couldn't go. Richard, Susie's boyfriend, has also helped with a few searches. But his demeanor catches Mary's attention. I didn't see a lot of real emotion. I really didn't. The state police speak to Richard and ask him where he was the night Susie vanished. Richard told us that he was home with his parents. He says he was playing video games on his computer, competing remotely with his friend Justin. Justin said that they were playing a game on the computer that he knew all of Richard's moves, so he knew it was Rich that was playing the game. Richard's story checks out, and police say they have no reason to suspect he's involved in Susie's disappearance. Investigators then confiscate Susie's computer to look for anything suspicious on her hard drive. Nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, nothing that would lead us to believe that, that some type of crime may have occurred. 
Mary can't help but to fixate on the last moments she spent with her daughter. The details of what had been a routine trip to Susie's grandmother's house now replay over and over in her head. When we got closer to where Rich lived, she said, would you mind stopping at his house? It's all right. It was the day before Valentine's Day, and it appeared Susie was dropping off a card for Richard. But Mary questioned Susie's real motivation for the stop. I think at that point, she was seeing somebody else, but I don't think he knew about it. And who knows what, what was in that Valentine. It might have been a Dear John <laughs> type Valentine. I really don't know, because things started, they were tense. Mary and Doug drop Susie off at her dorm room. As Doug hugs Susie goodbye, he is struck by the moment and has an odd premonition that he can't quite explain. He said, I just had this sense that something was wrong. And he said that was very, very sad. Because when we were driving home, he discussed that, you know, said, I, I just don't know. No evidence can be found confirming Susie had another boyfriend. Investigators turn their focus to Susie's dorm room access card. One of the security codes I have at the SUNY is when each student enters the dorm, they use a swipe card, uh, which will identify that they were entering the uh, dorm room at that time. And we checked her card on March 2nd from, you know, 9 o'clock on, and uh, it was not used. The state police zero in on the convenience store where Susie's ATM card was used. Investigators pull the surveillance footage and check the 30 minutes before and after the ATM transaction. But the security camera is located above the cash register, and the ATM is not in view. Still, using credit card receipts, police are able to track down customers who are seen approaching the register. They verify that none of them used Susie's ATM card. But there's one patron they cannot find. One of the customers who was in Stewart's around the time that her ATM card was used, remember seeing a black male wearing a black hat with some type of symbol on it. We did not know if he was possibly involved with her abduction or maybe had used the ATM card or maybe was just possibly a witness to something. Police dust the ATM for fingerprints, but don't find anything conclusive. Eager to talk to the unidentified customer, they release a sketch to the public of the patron now being dubbed the Nike Man. Well, the Nike Man did kind of increase our hopes that, well, at least there's, there's something. At least there's something. Coming up, a new piece of evidence gives Susie's family a glimmer of hope. We got right in the car to go down and see exactly where, where it was found. Winter months have passed in upstate New York and spring is bringing welcome warm temperatures. But the Lyle family finds little comfort in the onset of the new season. Their daughter Susie has now been missing for several weeks. No one has seen or heard from her since March 2nd. It's something that you never think is going to happen to you as a family. I mean, you always kind of fear that something like that is gonna happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of the worst possible fear. Investigator John Camp has built a special bond with the Lyles and wants nothing more than to bring Susie home to them. He searches every day to find that one piece of evidence that could crack the case. It's very frustrating as an investigator. I, I feel for the Lyles every day. Three weeks into the investigation, Camp turns his attention to someone he believes may know critical information about Susie her last roommate. Her former roommate had abruptly left school right after the first semester and had moved to Florida. And we had never been able to interview her. And we were very interested in, in what she may have had to say to us. Camp flies down to Florida to talk to Susie's former roommate, but he's unable to locate her. The girl's family tells him she now lives with her grandmother in Texas. Was well, somebody that we obviously wanted to talk to. At the very least, we wanted to see what she could remember about Susie. Uh, 
that probably one of the people at the school she would have confided in. So it was very important to us that, that we did uh, locate that individual and talk with her. Convinced that this young lady could hold a clue to why Susie disappeared, Camp flies to Texas to interview her. She just gave us a lot of background on Susie, but she really wasn't uh, able to uh, provide us anything that helped us as far as finding out why Suzanne disappeared. After we interviewed her, we found nothing that made us suspicious of, of her involvement at all. More than a thousand miles away from Albany, with a dead-end lead, Camp heads home, feeling defeated. It would not be until two months after Susie Lyle's disappearance that Camp would finally be handed his first piece of physical evidence in the case. On a breezy May evening, two students walking through the visitor's parking lot on campus locate Susie's work ID. We got right in the car to go down and, and see exactly where where it was found because I wanted to know exactly where her ID had been found and the circumstances. This got us a little excited, a little enthused that maybe this would lead to some information coming in. But finding the ID raises more questions than answers. Why hadn't it been noticed by anyone before that time? It, the, the campus had been scoured just about by searching. The visitor's parking lot is in close proximity to the bus Susie took to and from work, and not far from her dorm. But the location of the name tag presents a deeper mystery. After she would uh, exit the bus, if she was walking to her dorm, she would not have walked towards this, uh, this parking lot. Well, it gives us the indication that there's a possibility that she had exited the bus and, and had walked to the parking lot and possibly met somebody there. Did a familiar face lure Susie to the parking lot? The name tag is examined closely by investigators and processed for fingerprints and DNA. But the results are inconclusive. Meanwhile, Susie's parents question whether Susie's boyfriend Richard could be involved. There is no evidence linking him to her disappearance. But when the couple was dating, Susie's mother had her reservations about the young man's behavior. He was very possessive and very jealous of her wanting to talk to anybody else. One morning when Susie was still living at home, Mary says she heard the computer disk drive opening and closing in her sleeping daughter's bedroom. It was then that she learned that Richard could control Susie's computer remotely and that the two could monitor each other's online life. Police would like to interview Richard again, but he hires an attorney who denies investigators access, and Richard maintains he had nothing to do with Susie's disappearance. Susie's absence takes an emotional toll on her family, especially on the big brother who always treasured the spunky little girl who used to tag along behind him. My son Stephen was really having a very difficult time. He was working and he just couldn't go back to work and I don't think he went back to work for several months. His co-workers were really good about it, and they actually took up a fund and gave him some money so he didn't, he had no money. Um, other than that, he, he just suffered through that whole thing. We were on an emotional roller coaster, and, and that it didn't take much to, to kind of uh, push us off the deep end. Six months after Susie vanishes from her college campus, Investigators with the New York State Police crack open their cold case files to look for any similarities to Susie's disappearance. One catches their eye, the case of Karen Wilson, a young woman who also went missing from the State University at Albany. Doug Lyle remembers hearing about Karen's story on the news. We thought how horrible this is, how horrible it must be for the family, never thinking that um, that the family could be us. Coming up, a new lead makes Susie's family fear the worst. That's really close to home. That's less than 10 minutes from, from, from where we live. 
In the winter of 1985, Mary and Doug Lyle watch news reports about college student Karen Wilson's disappearance. They never imagined that they would one day be living the same nightmare. It's 13 years later, and their daughter Susie has been missing for a little more than six months. And they can't help but think of the parallels in the cases. They were both SUNY Albany students. They were both living in the same dorm complex. They were both getting ready to go on semester break. And, um, you know, they were both attractive young women. In both cases, the women seemed to vanish into thin air, leaving very little for investigators to go on. Karen Wilson was last seen walking on Fuller Road, walking back towards the campus at about 7.30 p.m. Police study the details of both cases for possible links. We look at any serial killers, any serial rapists, anything during the Suzanne Lyle investigation, any leads or information we developed that may have any connection to Karen Wilson's disappearance, we would obviously follow it up very seriously. Is there a person who was on campus or had a connection to campus when Karen went missing that was also there when Susie went missing? I mean, that's not out of the realm of possibilities. But after months of digging, investigators cannot find any common elements between the cases. Still, they vow not to dismiss the possibility that something could appear in the future. Nearly a year after Susie's disappearance, prominent billboards and continued news coverage provoke a solid lead in the case. Investigators have finally found the elusive Nike man, the unidentified customer at the convenience store, who police say could have used Susie's ATM card. We had numerous, many, many, many calls. Two or three people identified one particular subject who we located and he admitted to us that he was the Nike man, that he was in the, in the store that day. But after an extensive interview, police are struck with yet another disappointment. At this point, there's no credible evidence that we have found that uh, links him to Suzanne's disappearance. The Lyle family knew that making contact with the Nike man might not solve the case. But hearing conclusively that it's a dead end is a crushing blow. Looking back at it, I think a lot of people uh, maybe thought, well, you're spinning your wheels uh, by doing this. But, uh, you know, and then, in fact, he probably has nothing to do with, with her disappearance. Over the coming years, the Lyles stay in close contact with Investigator Camp. But it's not until 2005, seven years after Susie vanishes, that police receive their next substantial lead. A man has been arrested for the attempted abduction of a young female. The student was leaving track practice at her high school when he tried to pull her into his minivan. We found out Saratoga Springs the Police Department had made a contact with one of the investigators who works in our office. At that point, we told them that, you know, they knew we had a missing SUNY student in Suzanne Lyle. The high school's location, Saratoga Springs, sets off alarms for Doug Lyle. Could there possibly be a connection to his daughter's disappearance? That's really close to home. That's within uh, less than 10 minutes from where we live. Yeah, when something like that happens, someone tries to abduct a young lady, then, you know, you have to wonder whether there's a connection there. Investigator Camp works with the Saratoga Springs Police Department to put together a timeline of the suspect's known whereabouts. And Camp then tries to talk to the man, John Regan, in jail. But he refuses to cooperate. Stemming from charges unrelated to Susie's case, Regan is later convicted of attempted second-degree kidnapping. But to this date, we have not been able to link John Regan to Suzanne's disappearance. I would simply say, although we have not discounted him, we have not uh, ruled him out either. Investigator Camp has been working on missing persons cases for more than 20 years. 
the fact that the case of Susie Lyle remains unsolved continues to haunt him. I've become friends now with Doug and Mary Lyle. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to know how they feel, and I don't know how they feel. And being a parent myself, I think it's uh, a parent's worst nightmare is to have their, their child just disappear. Myself and the other investigators here with the state police worked very hard on this case, trying to find out you know, why and how Susie disappeared. March 2nd passes every year like any other day. But for the Lyles, it's the anniversary of the day when their lives were forever changed. Her disappearance is always there and it always will be. And it's just below the surface and we don't have to scratch very far to uh, bring it up or uh, to, uh, for me to bring me right back to that first day when I got that phone call. It's right there. One of the hardest things after a child has gone missing and never to be found again is when you go to their friends' weddings and things like that, or to a, a relative's wedding, and you're sitting there and you're looking at this bride come down the aisle and it's not your child. Despite their grief, the Lyles are committed to helping others who have suffered the same loss. They opened the Center for Hope a nationally recognized organization that assists families of missing persons. Being able to, to help other people has, might have saved our lives, I'll tell you, because uh, it's so easy when you have someone missing and you feel helpless, and that, that helplessness leads to hopelessness, that it's, a, it's like a downward spiral. And uh, for us to be able to to go out and start helping other people who are in similar situations and maybe spare them a little bit of grief that we went through. I mean, just when we can do this, uh, something like that, it, it makes all the difference in the world. The Lyles have also been instrumental in getting federal and New York state laws passed that are designed to facilitate missing person investigations. But no matter how much comfort they find in helping others, they will always carry the pain of knowing that their youngest daughter may never come home. Everything has changed. You know, I, I have a granddaughter and she's a, she's a joy to me, but she'll never have known Suzanne. She'll never know her aunt. And that's not fair. It's just not fair. We need answers. We need to, to find some answers to, to what happened because it's, it's against human nature not to know. And uh, I just, you know, I want to know before I, uh, before I leave this world. 